In this episode, I coach David Lang. It was a true delight. A law school graduate, David Lang transitioned from work in the oil and high-tech industries into full-time Israel advocacy at Israeli Cool. He is a respected commentator and Middle East analyst who has often been cited by the mainstream media. We discuss his dream for success in his life and business, and we do this by practicing the idea that goals are a place to come from, not a place to get to. Notice how his wish for our call is to come away from this call with one or more insights that he feels that can change an aspect of his life in a materialistic way. However, often the initial answer given is not the real answer they are looking for. So we dig deeper. We delved into the belief in people and in people's power. We talked about how his late wife, Ahavai Muna, of blessed memory, refused to fight cancer and instead chose to live with cancer. We share our different impacts on people and the world. We share ways to draw inspiration from unlikely places. Enjoy. Mm, one second. There you are. Good morning. Good morning. You and uh, and the big Lebowski. The that's dude. The first, that's the first test. If you don't, if you didn't recognize my background, there's no way you can make and help me make an impact. You have to know the big Lebowski, the philosophy of the big Lebowski. Sure do. I, I hope you have his uh, his um, his carpet. Oh, the rug. Mm. I, 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 yeah, I'm not going there. <laughs> but a fun, funny story. I know one of the, the guy that peed on, no, not the guy, one of the guys that peed on the dude's rug I'm friends with. He's a, he's a very um, pro-Israel actor. Really? He's named Mark Pellegrino. He's a friend of mine that I, I uh, met through my, you know, pro-Israel activities. Yeah, yeah fa- so, uh, look him up. Th- that's an interesting claim to fame. One of my claim to fames. I don't like to speak Gal about Gadot. it. Gal Gadot, that's right. Yeah, so Tell there we go. Story. Yeah. Tell me the story. It's fantastic. So. <laughs> um, you, you win. You win. I win. Well, as far as I know, she didn't. I'd rather know her than him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I tried reaching out a couple of times and she's ghosting me. You know, she got a bit too big for her heels. So, so it's just funny that we're meeting now, like we're on, on Zoom, you know, you're how many meters away from me? About, uh, I don't know. 70? Yeah, maybe? something like that. Less than 100. All right, no worries. <laughs> Beautiful. So tell me what's going on with you. So from a professional point of view also, that might be of interest to you. So, you know, yeah. I worked for SAP, the software company, for 17 and a half years, and about... Two years ago, I left. I took a voluntary retirement package, retrenchment package. Um, at the time, anyway, it's very hard. I was working from home, you know, to look after my wife. And I've started, you know, my Israeli cool Hasbara activities. So I've started that as an Amuta. So that's kind of a goal of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you mind if I, uh, if I coach you? No, I'd love it. I, I see your Facebook post, uh, posts and I read them. You're the I'm one. Happy. What? You're the one. No, come on. You get clients. I mean, I, I enjoy your humor. I, pre- I mean, I appreciate your humor because that's... Not you know, everyone does. <laughs> no, with my... That's, you know, with Israeli cool, humor is a main part of it. Um, right. Using humor, even with serious topics. Um, I, I'm a big believer in humor. So I like your humor and also I like the fact that you, let's say, you don't put in the hard sell. It's... It, like I've read, you know, I've read some of your longer posts as well. I'm a, I'm a lurker, you know, I don't necessarily comment or like the post, but I've, you know, I've, I've been reading some of them. So, the, you know, it's interesting how you, I wouldn't even call it a selling technique. It's more kind of getting people to buy in. I was, I was going to ask you, so tell me a bit about what you do. And then my second question would be, let's, given what I told you about me, I'll let you decide on what you want to tell me in more depth. Do you know what I mean? So here, let's, let's, let's play a game. You ready? Okay. 
Yeah. Awesome. It's, it seems like you like to play games. I do. Awesome. Okay. So what would make this call extraordinary for you? I think what would make it extraordinary is if I come away from it with one or more insights that I can, I feel can change an aspect of my life in a material way. Meaningful Fantastic. Way. So I'm glad you used the word insight because I coach around insight. When I coach, I ask the people I work with not to look for information, but for insights. Okay. Because one insight could literally shift your world. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So that's an important distinction that I want to draw out at this moment. Okay. So it's not about the information I'm relaying to you, but it's for the insights you will have. And that's what's going to make the change. So that's great. We're on the same page. Fantastic. Okay. So that's what would make your, this, this call extraordinary for you. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I, let me just, I want to just add one more thing Go ahead. when I was describing me, because I think it might be relevant, but it's funny. I'm in that kind of frame of mind because I've, you know, from a fitness point of view and health, I've kind of, I've, I've got this app, I've downloaded this app called Noom. Are you familiar with it? Noom. Noom. Uh, it rings a bell. You should look at it oh, anyway. Oh, that's, that's a meditation one? Is that a meditation? No, it's all about... Um, oh, for, the diet. Lose weight. The diet one, yes. Noom. Yeah, but it's not just about diets. It's about lifestyle. And the thing is, all they're doing, you read like one minute and then the two minute thing. It would be, first of all, you should look at it anyway because... I'm not saying it's the same thing, but like they give, they, they, it's not about dieting. It's about, it gives you motivation. It goes behind the psychology and you're reading these little blurbs every day mm. and it's giving you like insight, insights, actually use the word insight and to make it more sustainable over time. You know, say stuff like don't, you know, what happens if blah, 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 and you fall off the wagon, don't worry. And it kind of gives you positive reinforcement. It. And mm -hmm. so I've been starting it just, you know, from a, just for health. I don't really need to lose too much weight, right? I'm pretty okay. But just to have a healthy, you know, what I eat and, the, you know, I'm walking more and just, I just want to be healthier. Right. Um, I just want to mention that to you as well, because one, Thank you. I'm kind of in that zone at the moment, always looking for more, how to improve myself. And also too, I thought you should maybe just have a look at Noom because as someone, a practitioner of insights, mm -hmm. it could be very interesting to you how they approach it. Amazing. And so they use a thank lot you for that. They use a lot of humor in there. It's great. It's really good, yeah. Awesome. Anyway, so thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, so let's get ready to play. Okay. Okay. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Okay. And I want you to take a moment and imagine vividly what your perfect life will look like in three years time, 2024. Have a really clear picture of what your business looks like, how much time you're spending on your business and, and on your family, um, how much money you're making a month, clear number. You know exactly what's happening. Yeah. What your life is looking like, where you're spending other time. And then I want you to tell me what was it three years ago in 2021, what insight, what, what um, decision you made, whatever it was that put you on that trajectory that brought oh. you to that success. Okay, so in a minute, you're going to close your eyes, take a moment, take a deep breath, and you're going to call me up on the phone from 2024. We're both going to be in 2024. We hadn't spoken in three years, not because of COVID. That's all good. Right. <laughs> we hadn't spoken and you're going to start the conversation and say, Oh my God. And you're going to tell me all about your amazing life. Okay. Here we go. Wow. Okay. Okay. Oh Amen. my God. Oh my God. Hey, hey David. David. Long time. Long time no speak. What's up? 
So listen, I want to just tell you, so we haven't spoken in like three years, but I wanted to just update you on what's going on in my life. Yeah. So as you know, I mean, you, we haven't seen much of each other, but you know, I still live in the neighborhood. Mm. And since we last spoke, um, I put an extension underneath my house. Wow. I built a, a, an apartment underneath. And the reason for that is I want my, you know, my, you know I've got um, two married daughters. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, and I decided to do that, not just when I have guests, I have more room in the house, but like to give them, um, you know, the first year of their marriage, at least to, you know, give them like rent-free, um, you know, place to stay so they can be close by and I can be near my grandchildren. Amazing. And so that's been amazing. Um, and what allowed me to do it, you know, I made a lot of, um, I made a lot of uh, progress with my, Israel advocacy, my Amuta. Mm. Um, yeah, so you know, I got the donors that I needed. I'm now, I mean, if you don't mind me saying, I can tell you how much I'm Please. making. Yeah. So you know, just from that alone, I'm making now the, I'm making a salary of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. A, month, a year. Okay. Yeah, a year. Um, but the Amuta actually takes in more than that, and I actually have. Um, so a that's of your takeaway. Years. Hmm? your takeaway is yeah my right? salary from the amuta the amuta is making like half a million uh, dollars wow. and yeah i wanted to hire more people because i spend so much time doing a lot of the social media stuff i i focus now on the content i'm writing i'm doing a lot of videos and podcasts um and i'm kind of spending more time on the, the core of what i enjoy doing i'm giving some seminars wow and i'm really I feel like I'm really making more of a difference than I was in 2021, even where I was making a difference, but now, you know, it's much more well-known and I see the results more because I focus more on what the passion of it and not the, the stuff around it, which is, you know, the social media posts and the stuff that I can kind of sometimes get caught up in. Mm. It's very time consuming, you know, creating graphics and things to kind of sell my content. I hired someone for that who's more proficient than I was. Um, and that's really good. And I have also got someone, I've hired someone for the fundraising. So, you know, because fundraising isn't really my strong suit. I'm the content person. I'm the person behind it, but I'm not really so proficient at asking for money. So what uh, exactly was, what changed? Because then we were talking 2021 and it's like, okay, you were, you were doing okay, but you realize that there's, you, you need to grow even more. Right. So what, yeah. what changed? I think I just became more proactive about uh, changing things around. So I, whereas in fun, you know, a lot of times I just sit and write and do just continue doing the same things and just sort of hope for the best. Um, I started actually after speaking with you back then, um, you know, just coming up with an actual action plan to make some changes, still not, no, no guarantee that things would work, but to change my routine. So I got, for instance, I spoke with, you know, I sort of got, I, I, I went out of my comfort zone and did start a bit of fundraising because I have to start somewhere, even though I'm not so comfortable with it. And I, you know, I did actually have a few successful bites and that sort of got me rolling. It gave me more confidence. And it got me to the point where then I was able to then hire someone at least part-time to do the social media, like on contract. And then I was able to focus more on my content. And then it sort of, I became, you know, more, the content got better. And then I was able to bring in more donors. And then it sort of spiraled into to a point where, I'm, where I am today. Um, and by making the, you know, the additional money, the additional income, it sort of made me more relaxed. Even though in 2021, I was okay. I just then, um, you know, I was able to actually, I, I, you know, I started spending less time on work and sort of more, because I felt less pressure to kind of build it up as much, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I, yeah, I spent even more time with my family and more time. I had a much better work-life balance. So I think that that's, that was the key for me. Amazing. So now I want you to take another deep breath and take your time before you exhale. And when you're ready to exhale, you can exhale with power. 
<sighs> Whenever you're ready. <sighs> now I want you to describe the physical sensation you have in your body now. What are you feeling? Um, I'm relaxed from the breath, I think. Relaxation more. Um, contentment, perhaps. And where <laughs> Not are full you, contentment, but yeah. Where are you feeling this in your body? Um, right now, actually, my head is kind of a, a bit light, but in a good way. You know, like I don't feel like I've got heavy thoughts. Does that make sense? Like. Yeah sort of almost like a little bit of a, a little high, not, not a full on whiskey club high, but um, kiddish club, but you know, like a kind of, yeah, feels good mm -hmm. from the head. You see the, the power of this little game we played, it derives from the idea that goals are a place to go to, to reach as opposed to what I did with you now, is a goal is a place to come from. Because what you did- Back to back from the future, so to speak. Because yeah. that goal was inside you. You just yeah. projected it outward so you and I could see it. And then you described the steps you already took to get there. So yeah. now going back to 2021, you know exactly what you need to do right now in order to get there. So it's not a place that's detached from you. It's a place that you come from. Lives, it lives within you. And you see, like, you are a, um, an observant Jew, so I could share this insight um, that I found a, uh, a Jewish source for this concept oh wow everything's there <laughs> everything everything um and it's by uh Rav Tzadok HaKohen of Lublin his books are right here and he has a profound idea uh, you know our sages say <laughs> that every person should say every single day when will my actions and deeds reach the act actions and deeds of our forefathers Avraham Yitzchak and Yaakov so he says, who are you kidding? Like, give me a break. Really? Yeah. I'll kidding yourself? <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. Seriously? Like, okay, so they're role models or whatever. But that's like so beyond. He says, no. He says, the idea is that um, they have already um, paved the path for us. They've done it already. When it's... The question is, when will we walk in their footsteps that they've already done? They've done the hard work. And in modern language, I would say they have embedded their DNA of their success in us. So we don't have the majority of the hard work to do. It seems like we do, but we actually don't. So when, when our sages tell us that a person has to ask himself every day, when will I be like them? isn't when will I achieve such greatness as they did? Just simply walk in the path that they did. They already did it for you. You have to walk it now. So it's much, much, much smaller and tangible. It's in your hands to do right now. That's great. Wow, yeah. <laughs> so that goal is already within us. And we just have to project it outwards and see what was it that they did and just walk the walk. It's very interesting, as you're saying it, I have a thought. So when you look at the Avot, that's exactly what each subsequent of the Avot did, right? We learn that Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, what did Yitz everything repeats itself. Do you remember? Like, With the I mean, you know, and we learn from the Chazal that, you know, because his father did this, you know, he goes to, you see that, you know, they, they go to Egypt and that whole thing with, you know, Avi Melech, was it, and all Paro, mm -hmm. and get same situation and you're like why is this repeating itself exactly. and and the tefillot you know they each instituted a different tefillah like they they knew they took from their their abba that uh there's a template 
And now I'm going to follow that template, even though they were very different people. Avram was the go-getter. Yitzchak was kind of the learner. He was more, you know, and, and introvert. Then, yeah, kind of introvert, yeah, yeah. But actually, Yaakov was an introvert. Um, oh, he was? Okay. I mean, oh, yeah, right. He was the, uh, he was the dweller of uh, intents, right? But he was kind of a mix, maybe. He was the introverted extrovert. Yeah. Yitzchak, I think, was more the classic introvert, and Avram was the classic extrovert. Um, that, right, that relates to what you're saying, that, yeah. um, that in, embedded in their DNA was already the blueprint, and they all tried, like, willingly and uh, consciously to follow that blueprint. Exactly. Yeah. But that's a very empowering insight because now I can do this. Yeah. And I, I, I have my Northern star. Yeah. I'm not shooting in the dark and I'm capable of doing it. But one of, uh, I'll share with you a couple more ideas that are, uh, one, one is, a, is a beautiful quote um, that I use as my, my glasses, my lenses that I put on before I come into a coaching session as a coach. It's by uh, Johann uh, uh, Goethe, you know, the German poet from about 200 years ago. I don't, but okay. <laughs> Make believe you do, just for the sake I'm of I'm not gonna nod call. like, yeah, yeah, I know him. <laughs> yeah, of course, right? Because like, if you would have had his picture in your background. <laughs> no, I, well, yeah, these, these are my poets, yeah. <laughs> of course. So, um, so he said something really profound. He said, if you, treat a person as he is he will remain as he is but if you treat a person as who he ought to be and could be he will become who he ought to be and could be now the distinction i want to draw out here is as opposed to karma the law of attraction all, all these woo woo stuff which have some power to them he's not saying if you see a person as who he ought to be and could be he says if you treat a person as who he ought to be and could be so I come into a coaching session and I put on these special magical glasses that I have to work really hard to not see the coachee as they present themselves and as how they believe they may be are, but rather as who they are, who they could be and ought to be. And then I have to treat them as such. Not only see them as such, but actually treat them. Okay. And then I have some clients who I told them, how about you print out that quote and literally stick it on your mirror? So when you wake up every morning, you look in the mirror and you're naturally deceived by what your eyes are telling you because your eyes are giving you information. Of, okay, this is who I am. And that's with all the baggage in the past and you know all my history and I can't get rid of that. And that's how you show up in the world a second later. You leave, you leave that room and you go out and you remember that's who I saw in the mirror. Mm -hmm. But if you have this quote, it gives you two steps. Number one, you've got to see yourself differently, but then you've got to treat yourself differently. You're going to show up differently. Not only see other, treat other people differently, but start with yourself. Treat yourself as who you could be and ought to be, right? And the example I like to give is a lawyer who's, let's say, two years out of law school and has this huge goal and aspiration and a dream of being a 300K a year lawyer. And for him, it's like an impossible dream. <laughs> so if he would start treating himself like a 300K a year lawyer, he most probably would decline to take on smaller clients, 1K client, 2K clients, because a 300K a year client doesn't deal with those cases. His schedule will look different because he will treat himself differently. So that's something actionable and tangible that anyone could do as opposed to just seeing yourself, which is like, just like hoping things will change. But if you actually live differently, you're already on the path of becoming that different person. You are the different person. Like, Correct. Exactly. You, you are that person in the future. That's right. Um, you're already on that you're path. You're living as if you've gotten to the goal already. Correct. Because your frame of reference is the person that got to the goal already. That's right. Yeah, it's interesting. I, the other, the other idea I like to share is um, one of my really core beliefs. Um, also, an idea from uh, Rav Tzadok Cohen of Lublin. <coughs> he says something profound. You know, at the beginning of the Torah, it says that that God created man in 
his image. But God doesn't have an image. So what does that mean? Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Not only he doesn't have an image, we are not allowed to give him an image. So, so what, what, what's going on here? So he says something beautiful. He says that God's image, image means perception. So we perceive God in a certain way. So how do we perceive God? Well, think of the first man in the world. He was put in Gan Eden. What is his relationship with God? God is not his father. God is not his buddy, his peer, his colleague. He's not his teacher. What's the relationship? The relationship is that God is his creator and he's the creation. So his image of God is creator. That's how he perceives him. So when God says, I created man in my image, Rav Sadok says, it means the same way I have the power to create worlds, so do you. That's powerful. Wow. Now, on a miniature scale, of course, but it's the same power. Hmm. Wow. And that's a core belief of, me, of my life. I believe in humans. Rav right? Sadok says from that idea, he says, he, he takes it a step further, and his words are, like, wow. He says, the same way there is a commandment to believe in God, so too there is a commandment to believe in man. It's not like a hocus pocus thing to reach our potential. It's like we're supposed to. We were born to do it. And it's all within us. It's not about an external person or belief that, boom, now we're worthy. Because we, weren't, we were never worthy. We, we, we were scum. This is the exact opposite. It's very uh, empowering. They yeah. love it. They lo I share this with everyone. And I do love it, yeah. And it's, they, they, look, this is, the world is thirsty for yeah. this type of, of life. And there's so much emptiness and a void to be filled. Yeah. This is what needs to be filled, filling that void. And they, they just suck it up. It's like, wow, it's, it's so refreshing. We desperately need more faith in the human race. I mean, not just, I'm not talking about now with the original sin. I'm just saying in general, the way the world is right now and culture and everything. It's like, I'm, you know, I've been losing, I would lose faith, let's say, in the human race if I didn't have this emunah that I do that things will work out because sure. of my faith in Hashem. Because if you just look at the way things are going, you know, with the cancel culture and everything, it just like looks dire. Um, but yeah, you're right. This is very uh, powerful. And I'm sure they lap it up. They do. And, and the, next, the next step, which relates especially to people who are um, in, in, I would say, leaders by nature or have learned to become leaders in any form, yeah. right? It's what I call the rebels. They're the ones who really shift the world. And they could be even just leaders of their own life or leaders of their family. It doesn't have to be Elon Musk, Hollywood producers. Elon Musk, is big scale, rebel. Right. Elon Musk, it could, but it could, it could be, yeah. my mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But his style, but even in miniature, like yeah. just a person who, who took ownership of their life. And um, what I share with them is something that shifted my life from in one instant. Happened... Um, about 25 years ago, when I was in yeshiva, <coughs> the rabbi, he gave an interesting class, and he, <coughs> I believe he quoted Rabbi Sarah Salanter, who gave this, this idea. He said that, uh, I don't have to give you the context because you're, a, you're a religious Jew, but he asked the question, he says, if a person, if you are in the middle of Shemonesri, davening in the middle of a forest, and you see something in the river, in the corner of your eye. He asked, he said, it, it's possible that it's just a log floating there, in which case you just have to ignore it and continue with your prayers. But if it's a human being drowning, of course you have to stop your prayers and go and save the person. So he asked, is there a way to tell without moving if it's a human being or a log? And he said, yes, there is. He said, if it's going with the stream, it's a log. If it's going against the stream, it's a human being. Hmm. Going against the stream. 
It's a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. And I, I tell everyone, you got to, every moment of your life, you must choose. Are you a log or are you a human being? Because there are constant streams fighting us every second. You have to be cognizant of it. You have to be fully aware and fully engaged to be prepared to play the game. Wow. And you have the choice. That shifted my world instantly because I realized I was the only student there who stood up and said, that's me, right? And the truth is that there are different levels of living into that idea, right? So you could take it like as, um, as a community, let's say, at a community level, we choose to go against the stream of what the community does around us. And then you have as a nation, okay? So we're not like other nations. But then the deepest level is there's never a stream that fits you. You are always an individual going against everything. Wow, yeah. Hmm. So the real core rebels are the ones who are like, the more no-sayers and naysayers, the better. That just shows me that I'm on the right path. I like it. Wow. Hmm. But, but at some level, at some level, I believe everyone has that to, to a certain extent, right? And that's the power of choice. You gotta, you gotta stand up and say, no, I'm not a log. Yeah, very nice. I'm not a log. These guys behind me look a little logish at the moment when I'm looking, sitting like logs. <laughs> totally, totally. Listen, I, I, I'm gonna pause the call for about one minute. I have to move to another room. Okay. And we're gonna continue in a second. I'll be okay? here. Okay, okay, no worries. Great, so just. Okay. Welcome back. Ah, thank you. Nice. The more back. barren background than all the far in. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife has a client coming in now, so I, <clears throat> I'm sorry I had to. Had no, to no worries. Over. That's okay. so interesting. You both have like clients and from home. It's nice. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it is. It, it's amazing. I I was in high tech, like you like you know for. Yeah, I remember you telling me ten years, and you know there were good sides to it. Absolutely. But, you know, I realized, um, in, in, I realized it as it was happening, but I wasn't living up to it for many years that I was coaching everyone around me all the time, right? <clears throat> um, there, was, there was a story I like to share that happened almost 20 years ago when I was in yeshiva. <clears throat> I got a call from a mother who did not know me. And she asked, if I don't mind meeting her son. He was 13 or 14 at the time, actually from, from Ramat Bechemesh. Brilliant kid. He was asking deep philosophical questions and no one could help him. And I said, sure. She sent him to my yeshiva in Efrat, where I was studying at the time. I met with him once or twice each time for about an hour or two. And that was it. I hadn't heard back for several months. And then she suddenly calls me up <coughs> out of the blue and she says, I got to tell you, you were the only one who could help it. We sent him to other rabbis, even to a therapist, nothing. It was only you. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, do you want to know why it was only you? I said, sure. She said, well, I was in shock when I asked him myself. Because he said, you were the only one who was smiling the entire time. Wow. Hmm. So what do you think that meant for him? So I'll tell you. <laughs> the power of a smile is tremendous. Also the Gemara, I think in Ketubot says that um, smiling to another person is greater than, than giving them a glass of milk. Now a glass of milk doesn't seem like something really profound, but we could leave 
the, the yeah. analogy aside, but the greatness of a smile to someone else is extreme. I know that it wasn't just the smile. What's behind it is um, that people are broadcasting messages at different frequencies. It's basically like reading between the lines. So we <laughs> typically perceive and, um, and work at certain frequencies when a person is speaking, right? So there's usually just the verbal. You could look at their body language. That's another level, their tonality and so on and so forth. But there's even deeper and deeper and deeper levels of listening, tuning in to those frequencies. And that was his frequency. And so <clears throat> I have that ability to tune in to deeper frequencies than most people. I believe it's, I, I believe it could be taught. Most people could catch on to this if they're trained in it. Some people have it more naturally, like other talents and skills. And I have that. So I could tune in and receive messages that the other people he was speaking with weren't receiving. It's interesting the way you explained it because you know some people would say, "Oh, I'm I'm very perceptive." Like what you've just described is actually perception, being perceptive about it's surroundings, not- about people. It's like no, but it's like really understanding the mood, as you said, the tone of someone. But it's That's, more than yeah. that. It's 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 really more because though those are still surface levels, right? You need those to go deeper. You can't ignore them, but. The idea behind this way of listening is that you have, to, you have to really understand that all those are still just masks. Yeah, yeah. So they're expressive masks, but they're just the mask. You have to go deeper. So now, with this kid, what did you perceive beneath the surface? Um, <laughs> I don't well, know who he is, so... It's not Lashon Ra. I mean, no, no, no. He's a great kid. I, I, I actually <laughs> curious. I'm curious I, I, about this. It, it, it's interesting because I actually lost contact after I never saw him again till uh, about a, just over a year ago, a more oh, wow. you know, a year and a half ago. I met him on the bus here in Beit Shemesh. Oh wow! Of all and places, he came to me. He recognized he, you. He came to me, and at first, because I hadn't seen him in almost twenty years, right? So. I guess I didn't change much, <laughs> but he came to me and he said, do you remember me? And it took me a second, right? And, and I remembered him. I forgot, his, I forgot his first name, to be honest. That I, can his, yeah. I, I, I yeah. did remember his last name, but I forgot his first name. Mr. So-and-so. That's right. yeah. <laughs> so it was a little bit embarrassing, yeah. Yeah. but he was okay with that. And, and, but but he, he said something interesting. He said, you know what? I'm a bit disappointed that you didn't remember my name. I said, really, why? He says, because you had such a profound impact on me. And I remembered you. That was a lesson for me. Yeah. And he's, Baruch Hashem, he's living in Ramat Bet Shemesh. He has you know, two kids, I think, two or three kids even. And he's flourishing. He's doing great and everything. I'm like, wow, I hadn't had zero contact with him for almost 20 years, right? So um, we spoke about deep philosophical stuff that a lot of people, I'll I'll give you an example of something that did bother him. Yeah. And it's a very deep Jewish concept based in Kabbalah that um, when you have this insight, you look at, at, at the hard times differently. The Ramchal explains something so profound and so deep. <clears throat> he says, Hashem created the world. But in order to create the world, he needed to step back, so to speak, to give space for the world to exist because he's everything. He's all-encompassing. So in order to give um, space for another entity, another reality, he needed to step back. That's the void. He created this like void. That's where we live. The universe, the physical, the materialistic place that we exist in. Now, there are good things that happen and there are bad things that happen. So 
number one uh, um, a priori belief that you have to have as a Jew, he says, is that Hashem is all good and his nature is good. And therefore, he says, by nature, he should only be doing good things because his nature is to do good. So then how is there bad in the world? How's there room for bad? There's no it's, where he, it's where he stepped back. Correct. So what is bad? Bad is where he, he creates another void and he steps back and therefore there's, there's no room for vacuum in the universe. So when he's not there, there's hmm. the, the bad steps in. But yeah. that's, not, that's fine. That's okay to understand. It's the next step. He says, wait a minute. Think about this for a second. Think of a person who's going through a very difficult time in whatever facet of life. He feels disconnected from God at those times. And rightfully so, because by nature, we know that he's providing for us. He's all giving and he's good. So if there's bad, that means he's stepping away. But is it really bad? So let me, so what he's, the Ramchal Sorry, says, I'm what the Ramchal says, the, the Ramchal says, if by nature we said he is, he, by his nature is to do good, that means he's always, by nature, it's just flowing out of him. So if there's space for bad, it's as if God is holding back his nature even more to not be providing his good. So imagine the line of tension the border between where God is by nature, he's providing, and then he steps back a bit, leaves this void for, for the bad to be, and you're on this side, okay? So he says, the Ramchal says, during those moments and those spaces in time and space where there is bad, God is present even more because he yeah. has to try harder to not be there. So this is so interesting. So first of all, this is really resonating with me, given what I've been through. And I've, you obviously, I mean, it's not even a question. You've read Gan Hayam or not by Rava Rush. I did. And if you haven't, then I'd be very surprised. No, I have. He basically described what you just said, but in different terms. I mean, basically, what, if you remember back to that book, one of the things that really stuck with me, and you know, I read this book while my wife was very, very ill. She also read it. And it gave us so much more now was that the people that go through a lot of tsaras tend to be the ones where Hashem is really intricately involved in that situation and in their lives. It's the person, the multimillionaire person. I'm, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with making people multimillionaires with their yachts, but they're the ones that maybe need to pause and think, well, wait a minute, where's God? <laughs> like, or like to really make, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not that he's not in their life, but the ones where God is actually intimately involved to, Cause this difficult situation for some greater good. He wants, he's trying to trigger us to do something, to grow something. God's presence is very much there, which is again, hafuch to what the world teaches you, exactly. where I feel so bad. Like, why do good people suffer? You know, what, like there is no God, you know, and this is so, this was so powerful for me, even as a from Jew to, to read that and, and, get it and what you've just said at least from my point of view is just the rephrasing of that concept and that's so, kind of why i knew where you were going with this because perfect. i've read Dunham or now so to take it one step forward upon what you just added yeah there is a brilliant insight of the avne nezer who was the sochach of a rebbe about 150 well, almost 150 years ago yeah and he asked a, a, a brilliant question when god cursed the snake and said you shall crawl on your uh, on, on your bottom and and uh, 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 like uh, and you shall eat the earth of the dust. He said, "Why is that a curse? If his food is so, <laughs> it's everywhere. He doesn't need to work for his food." He said, "That's exactly the curse. What God yes. did to him, he said, I don't want to hear from you anymore. I'm going to give you food. You don't need to contact Detached. me. Detached. I don't want to hear from you. You're you're good, right? You stay away from me. That's the people, so right." The yeah. people who need to work hard, I want to hear their prayers. I, that's the connection I have with them. Yeah. So they're going to struggle a bit, but then they can reach out to me. And that's where the connection happens. I want to be disconnected from you. That's what God told the snake. That's exactly it. It's the growth. because the, it, 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 That's what gives you growth. 
it's sort of just to take it full circle with what we, we started with when you made me imagine 2024. Yeah. You need that growth. You need to sort of, you can't be static. The snake is sort of comfortable in a way with his life, right? Everything's provided and he just goes about it. But there's a tension, you know, it's sort of, it's halachic man in a way. I could draw off halachic man about this tension. You know, it's a good thing in, in Judaism, having tension, having uncomfortableness, having even hard times, if I can put it that way. It's, it's, it's growth. Hashem wants us to grow and develop, become better. Exactly. It's sort of almost like a kick up the tuchus. Um, That's exactly one of the distinctions that I help the people I work with make is that everyone's looking for intention. And what I try to help them do is not look for intention, but to live in tension. It's to so, be able yeah. to, to stretch that and be in the moment of tension. I remember what one of my yeah. rabbis once told us when I was young, he said something interesting. He said, uh, uh, the last few hours of Yom Kippur, when you're dying to eat already, right? Yeah. You're dying to drink, you're dying to eat. Just So a lot of people, what they tend to do is they like, all they're saying to themselves or they're even praying to Hashem, let this just be over with. Yeah. So one of the rabbis said that should not be your prayer. Your prayer should be, give me the strength to last yeah. in this state forever. Okay. This is amazing. So I'm just going to say that um, what you're saying really resonates with me. Um, I'm going to just tell you something maybe a bit controversial. You haven't told me too much new today, but by reinforcing, no, you, a, a bit of it. Don't get me wrong. Again, I just want to tell you, my Rebbe, my Rebbe was my wife. And I don't know, I'm, I'm good friends with Shlomo, Rav Shlomo Katz. Me too. I grew uh, up with him. <laughs> okay, that's funny. So, and he's even said this, I don't know if you saw, but when, after my wife passed away, you might not have known at the time who she was, but she was quite well, you know, her name was Ahava Emuna. And he, he when she passed away, he said, my Rebbe, her, he also said, my Rebbe passed away. Mm. And he actually wants to publish a book of her writing. So she wrote a blog. Wow. And one of the things she said, and by the way, everything that I tell you now, you can, of course, even use it in your, if you think it can help in your teachings and your, your, no, listen, it's like what you said. She refused, when people said, you know, how do you fight, you, you know, fighting cancer? You know, because people say I'm fighting cancer. She refused to say it. She said, I'm not fighting the cancer. I'm learning to live with it and live in that situation. And what you just said is actually, so this to me, I see this call, you know, you gave me this gift for my birthday, but also more of a gift than you understood. Because you're, you're bringing me back to this, what, you know, my wife taught me. And it's just, you know, the good feeling that when someone arrives at these conclusions through their study of psychology, through their learning, and it came from my wife, it came from her. I think she just got it from within. And I am convinced she was some sort of, um, she got this from Hashem. And it makes me feel, it, it gives me a very good feeling beyond what you can imagine, actually. To hear it from you, with, you know, you've really absorbed this and you've, I, I can tell you've studied all sorts of philosophies and besides Jewish, you know, like motivational stuff. And, and, and you're, you're telling me these things which just resonate so powerfully with me because I, I had them in me from her. And that is such a beautiful feeling for me. Someone that's, you know, been trying to, you know, I wouldn't even say get over because he'd never get over it, but live with her legacy and you're giving me that. So I want to thank you. It, like you've really made my day in, in a way I didn't expect, actually. I didn't expect that to come out of this. You know, I thought you might give me some, I'd come up with an action plan, which, you know, I probably do have as well, but like some steps, but you've actually given me a lot more. I want you to please take that with you from this call as well like in a good way with your day and onward. And you can even quote me on this without naming me necessarily. If you want, you can always, if you feel that will help you um, because it's true what you say. It's like, absolutely. I believe it like 10,000%. And just hearing it from you is so reinforcing for me. Oh, well, thank you. It's like it feels serendipitous. If, if you know what I mean, it, it feels like this was the call, Hashem wanted you to have this call with me um, for a number of reasons, for maybe for both of us to, to learn something through it, you know? Because you're just saying stuff and it's like, oh my God, it's like, it's just you're rewording stuff that I heard from her or we discussed. It's like really, Mamash, 
it really it, it means a lot to me. I hope that made sense to you. It did. <laughs> and it sounds like this was already an extraordinary call. Yes, I, so I didn't. If you said define the call as extraordinary, I wouldn't. I didn't define it like this, did I? No, I actually, not. it was still a good definition, might I add. But um, this is way actually beyond. This I like. Wow, it's like actually really beyond. So wow, thank you. I want to thank you. It really. I thank you for trusting me and taking you on this journey. No, I was very uh, fascinated. You know, because I told you I'd seen your Facebook posts and. Yeah, I read them and I'm like, wow, this guy seems pretty clued on. Yeah, but then when you offer me this, it's like, okay, wow, I got to hear this. I got to hear more. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's powerful stuff. And may Hashem bless you with success and and the ability to actually impact a lot of people. Because actually, what you and I do is, I mean, the end goals are the same, but in very different ways. We want to impact, right? We want to impact people's lives. I'm much more, let's say. It's more about, let's say, the perception of Israel and, and Jews. And, you know, that's kind of whatever Hashem gave me that kind of, uh, you know, that buzzing in my ear that I need to somehow. That's just my calling. What can I tell you? I don't know why. And I didn't. It chose me. I didn't really choose it. It just sort of happened. Um, and I realized, you know, because I, I have a law degree. Which I never used. Hmm. I never was a lawyer. But. Advocacy is what I do, right? That's, and it took me till I was way beyond 40 years of age. I'm 47 now, as you know, but um, to realize, you know, when I grow up, I want to be an advocate, but it's not a lawyer. It's advocating for something I really believe in and making that impact, you know, because I can see the impact. When I have someone say, listen, and I've, I've had this, you know, one of my, you know, someone that called me up yesterday was my friend in Dubai. I have a friend in Dubai. He's a very well-known businessman in Dubai. Now we, you know, now it's my turn to name drop. <laughs> You've never heard of him, by the way. But in Dubai, he's well-known. He's part of his family owned a conglomerate of. I never knew this. I met him on Twitter like ten years ago, hmm. and just through our friendship. And you know, I've, I've been just putting out my stuff. He started off being very pro-Palestinian. Now he's probably one of the most effective Zionists I know. It's not that he thinks that we're all perfect and he, he wants two states and he wants peace, but he sees the BS coming from the other side and he calls out on it. He's like, if you guys really want peace, you would have got it by now. I see that my, my Jewish friends, they want it. Actually, before this call, I was just chatting with him a bit because my, my daughter's going to, I'll, I'll finish up in a bit because I know you have to go and I also need to go. But um, she's going to the United States. Her, her best friend's there and her family are involved with some Florida Chabad you know, event and they're, they're flying her out, which is great. I mean, wow. but she's going through Dubai. So I contacted my friend and um, she's going to be in Dubai at 5.55 in the morning. And I thought, I'll just contact Fanny. That's his name. And, uh, you know, just let him know that the first Lang to set foot in Dubai is not me. It's my daughter. And then he, he's a big, I call him Fanny the Mensch. He's like a huge Mensch. We talk, you know, about religion and we have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of similarities actually between Islam and Judaism that we somehow lose sight of with all the other noise. And I said, oh, as a joke, he's like, well, let me know, you know, give her my contact details. If she needs help or anything, she can contact me. And I'm like, it's 5.55 in the morning, you know, let's both hope she doesn't need it. And he, he, he responded to me, he goes, no, no, it's okay. I'm up that early anyway to pray. And he wow. says, and I'm like, wow, that's early. I said, usually I'm praying, you know, way later. And he's like, and then he goes, but if I miss that, there's a sh until six or something, and then I've missed my chance. It doesn't count anymore. I'm like, oh my god, this is Judaism. <laughs> um, but I said ours is later. It was just, and then and then we, we spoke a little bit about it. And just you know, it's um, it's I'm just there's no real point to this story. Just to show that you know how humans can be so alike, and how you know you drive inspiration from the you know these unlikely places. Anyway, but that that in the point being just to tie it up, the impact. I really he credit he, there was a calculus conference in Dubai and it was televised on TV. The Israeli reporter, I forget his name, he's some gay, quite famous economics reporter, I guess. You probably know who it is. I don't really watch Israeli news. I avoid My news. friend Danny was on the stage and he told the story of 
uh, meeting me and how he became a Zionist. And that's, I can retire now from the point of view of goal. You know what I'm saying? You never give up on your goals, but that meant the world to me. One, you save one life, you save the entire world. Saving a life can also mean saving someone from their erroneous ideas. It might be changing you, what you're doing is saving lives because you put someone on the right path, whether it be your way or my way, right? That's saving a life. 